رمضان كريم I am pleased to be here when Ayan and I were communicating I told her maybe a good way to do this discussion about the relationship between culture and development might be just to have a session of questions and responses but she said no وحن ربع عشر إنت بحسو yeah, I want you to give a lecture, former lecture on this. So I accepted the assignment and I have been working on it really for the past two months. It's not yet complete, uh, but I am, I think, reasonably happy with it now to at least be ready to present it in front of the community uh, in English. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to your questions. Let me then begin by thanking Ayan uh, Mahmoud uh, for the warm welcome and her amazing organizational skills. Uh, the, I think, inauguration of Kaid is an important achievement. It's like raindrops in a desert, to be very honest with you, because there is nothing like this that exists anywhere where Somalis live, whether it is in the United States or in Canada or other parts of the world, at least I'm not aware of. A place uh, like this uh, and activities like this. So it's an enormous initiative and a great achievement and I want to congratulate her for doing this. I think from my point of view, a young Somali woman like Ayan portend a future that ought to be different than the present and the, and the recent past uh, where our lives are mangled and therefore we wish her long life Great blessings from Allah and success as she continues this project of organizing these activities. I want to also thank uh, those of you who have come here this afternoon. Uh, Ramadan is a very demanding month for Muslims. Uh, long, long fast, a lot of work at the same time, family and other activities. So it's not easy, uh, even on a Sunday, in Ramadan day, uh, to come at this hour, so I am very grateful that you have made the time uh, to, to, to be here. Uh, and then finally, I'm not sure whether he is here, but there is a man in this city uh, who has enormous place in my heart. He is now probably at least in his mid-80s, maybe even close to 90, Ahmed Ismail Hudaydi. I don't know whether he is here today. Uh, but I would like to send word from this particular microphone uh, that he's an enormous historical figure and we continue to celebrate uh, his standing among our so they have in front of you so that you have some sense of organizing your own uh, 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 understanding of this. What I would begin with would be some preliminary remarks that are not necessarily connected to the topic yeah? But they set the tone and the context in which the topic then will be interrogated. So preliminary remarks and assertions. Second, then I would like to give a definition in the, in the academy. If you want to make sure that people understand you, even when they disagree with you, you have to define your concepts. That's the central basis of an academic discussion uh, in, in the university. Yeah, you define your terms so that you know what I mean, and then you'll see if that fits into your own thinking. If not, then maybe you can offer an alternative. But I want to make sure that you understand what I mean by development, which is the central concept, and culture, those two. And the two are very related. I'll say a lot 
about culture, but as it relates uh, to, to development. So definition of the two primary concepts. Third, I would like to make a brief a meditations on subtopics of culture. Culture is a huge enterprise. And even if we are here for two, three days, I cannot cover all the aspects of culture. But what I would like to do is to pick up few items that I think, at least from my point of view, are very important uh, in talking about culture. And that is intellectual production, which is part of culture. That's number one subtopic I would like to engage somewhat. Two, I want to speak about music as an element of culture. Third, I want to then talk about poetry as another element of culture, and then religion as an important part of culture. These four items, intellectual production, music and music production, poetry, and religion. And then with some concluding remarks before I finish. So that's what the journey looks like. Now, some preliminary remarks then. Uh, let me begin by saying that there was a time when Somali people, whether they are from Somaliland or whether they are from Somalia or whether they are from Djibouti uh, or whether they are from other parts of the Horn of Africa, Zone 5, uh, the old Northern Frontier District, whatever the Somalis live, but particularly those who lived in the Old Republic. There was a time when these Somali people had important collective assets. For example, though the Somali people were always living in a very precarious environment and therefore in terms of material life somewhat poor, and they continue to be poor and brittle, all you have to do is watch when rains don't arrive for one year and everybody is in crisis, let alone two or three years. That's the degree of how brittle societies are. Yet they exuded a hardy sense of self-reliance and had faith in the coming of a better future. Strong capacity to per persevere in the face of very difficult environmental and other kind of a circumstances. And also a sense uh, that tomorrow might be better or the next year might be better. They were always somewhat future-oriented. And in that sense, people would hope. Secondly, Somali people in the Horn of Africa, and particularly the Old Republic, the highly tolerant and flexible brand of Islamic practices. Islam that was very deep in their soul and yet was highly tolerant and extremely flexible, which coexisted with old ways of Somali tradition and Somali life. That has changed somewhat. Third, all Somali people, not of the present, had an enviable belief, called Sony Hugli, in talent and administrative fairness. Management of life and talent were something that Somali people recognized and saw it as a credit, whoever the person was or the community were. Has in the middle way you right. That's my point. Fourth, <clears throat> perhaps fifth, the Somali people also, in these early times, had a strong level of what the Italians, the Renaissance Italians, used to call dignita, or uh, perhaps a closer translation, not quite as loaded as the Renaissance language, but uh, close, dignity in English. But dignity is much more than the way we know dignity now in the English language. A dignity that, and generosity which was recognized by other Africans around the continent. Uh, there goes the Somalis. Great sense of dignity and pride and very generous uh, with other peoples. Africans and the rest of the world knew about this in terms of the Somali people. But most of all and lastly, the Somali people had a thriving, very thriving and deep cultural creativity that was manifested uh, and manifested itself through exquisite poetry, drama, dance, music, and song. These were characteristics that the Somali people were known very much for. Now, 
Those are the old assets. My beginning argument to you, therefore, tonight, to this afternoon, is that from the vantage point of the present, this afternoon, I would suggest, all these virtues have either greatly been eroded, and some of them are vanishing. What little that survives is, to put it very politely, is covered by a great deal of dross, thick dross, Body, you see, the, you yeah, that's what dross means. Yeah. Consequently, it is now obvious, at least to me, that a revival, if not a resurrection, is unavoidable. If Somalis have any chance of regaining their self worth among the world's peoples, that resurrection will have to take place. And to begin that long journey of recuperation and rebuilding and resurrection, that urgent and monumental assignment I suggest to you this afternoon requires gatherings of this kind, this type of gatherings, in which truth-seeking, careful listening, rigorous and civilized discussion on difficult topics are always practiced. To accomplish that, I suggest to you, we must learn how to cultivate a mixture of reasoning intelligence, reasoning intelligence, discriminating judgment, and mutual sympathy, if not love. A discussion of culture can therefore advance such a task, and the pursuit of a Somali renaissance aiming at high excellence. In this context, I would like to acknowledge this afternoon someone whose outstanding and continuing contributions are the antithesis of this age of dissolution, resentment, and demeaning mediocrity. This is Brother Bashir Sheikh Umar God. Bashir Sheikh Omar God has three, at least four characteristics that I suggest most of you to, ought to take a note of. And this attribute is making him stand out in any crowd among Somalis when it comes to these kinds of discussions. Bashir Omar, Sheikh Omar God is a magnificent poet whose work touches many aspects of global and Somali life. So that's the first characteristic. And we could say a lot about that, but I don't have a time to elaborate on this. Second attribute of Bashir that makes him stand out in any Somali crowd is that he is an elegant and fluent writer in at least three languages at a very high, high octane level. Somali, English, and Arabic. Third, Bashir is also a paragon, an example, of the cosmopolitan public intellectual with considerable courage and heft, weight. And then finally, Bashir has accepted long time ago and embraced the call of learning as an essential part of his own very existence. His superb and pioneering biographical essay on the entrancing and peerless, the late Halima Khalif Magol, published in the pages of Bildan in 2014, attests to Bashir's exceptional literary sensibilities and creative gifts. So for those of you who want to pursue that, the first essay here is about the biography of Magol, uh, in which we hope later on will become a book. Now, having made those initial assertions, let me then move on to the substance of the lecture. Development and culture. Well, what is development? Two basic definitions, and they reinforce each other. One is that development is a massive and perpetual project of the transformation of a society. All societies, and I'll come back to this at the end, all societies, including this one, 
one of the oldest industrial societies, the first industrial society in the world, right here, continues to struggle with the issues of development, of renewal. Things get old, they have to be renewed. Roads, railways, bridges, uh, telephones, electrical systems, you name it. So development is something that all societies engage. It's a massive, perpetual, abadi, forever, project of transformation of society. That's the first cut. The second point of development is that this effort must be applied in equal measure to the four paramount and highly interconnected dimensions of human existence. If you look at human life and you slice it up, there are really four important dimensions of human existence. Whatever society that you are talking about, whether it's a Somali society or whether you are talking about the British society or whether you are talking about the American society, you name it. And these are these four dimensions of human, spheres of human existence. Environment, economy, politics, and culture. If you take those out of, of, of society, take the politics out, take culture out, take the environment out, take the economy out, there's nothing left. Hardly anything is left. So these to me are the central pillars of any kind of a society. Development takes place in all of them all the time. How to deal with environmental questions, whether it is erosion in the case of Horn of Africa and desertification, or whether here in cleaning up the rivers here. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, the BBC, a young boy in the BBC, I remember the Thames River being so dirty that when you walk by it, it will it smell. Uh, it has been cleaned, I think, since, of course, I assume. Uh, but no society escapes the challenge of environmental uh, questions, always. In America, we are running into this uh, all the time. And now, of course, global warming, the biggest one of them all, uh, the massive change in the environment, which affects human, human life. Same thing with economy, sustenance, livelihood, and of course politics, organizing society, civil society, and then culture, which is our topic today. So I will not talk a great deal about the economy or the ecology or politics. I will concentrate most of my presentation, therefore, on this fourth sphere of human existence, which is the sphere of culture. What is culture then? Second concept. Culture is equivalent to what the philosopher Wittgenstein used to teach at Cambridge, but uh, from, from Europe. Wittgenstein called this form of life, culture as a form of life. That is sedimented habits and time hollowed practices that people repeat again and again and again and again. That's part of their existence. This kind of a sedimented habits and time hollowed practices is the source of what we call in the academy tacit knowledge, T-A-C-I-T, tacit knowledge, something that is so deeply buried in the consciousness, in the consciousness of people, tacit knowledge. And therefore a store of insight and cultural wisdom. The second element of culture is the formation of ideas. Culture is the formation of ideas. What Ibn Khaldun, the great Islamic philosopher and jurist, called habits of excellence. Yeah? Formation of ideas. Symbols that make it possible the virtue of self-command. In That you can control uh, your own habits. Independent thinking and robust intersubjectivity, mutual understanding of each other, intersubjectivity. This is the very distinct, very distinct from enslavement to stagnant superstitions. Stagnant superstitions, something very important that Somalis have to think about, because I will argue a significant part of the Somali people now suffer from stagnant superstitions. Prejudice that causes the mutilation of ignorance. Ignorance can mutilate the mind, and in the end, the society itself. So the formation ideas is against that kind of mutilation of, of society through ignorance. And then the third element of culture is in the realm of the aesthetic. 
where the artistic performance, Hudaydi is here now, the artistic performance and the virtuosity is supreme. How he plays the oud at the virtuous level is supreme. None of us sitting here will be able to do that unless we spend, I don't know, 60 years or more like him. And even that will require some initial talent that you have. It's not just a practice. You also have to have some gift that you can actually do something like this. So the realm of the aesthetic, where the artistic performance or virtuosity are supreme, is central to culture. An encounter with such a display of perfection has a number of somewhat contradictory consequences. If you sit in front of Hudaydi or someone like him or a great abuan like Hadrawi or uh, Tima Adde, now he's no more with us, or Hassan Sheikh Moumin or people like that, you sit in front of them, at that level of perfection, of capacity, it creates a number of things that really are, I would argue to you, somewhat contradictory. One, that level of performance shocks us. At his peak, it shocks you. Beauty at its form can shock you. If you see a beautiful woman, it shocks you. What's that? Look at that. The same thing with this, with art. It shocks you. Which means, therefore, it shocks you because you are coming face to face with the intimidation of pure excellence. Yeah. Excellence wa laka absoda. Wa absibi ku gilinis. That face to face encounter with excellence makes us speechless, silent, speechless. Yeah. When you go to great orchestras here in the United Kingdom in London, you go to great or orchestra. And you are listening to someone who is who's playing the piano, for example, or the cello, or something like that. And if they are at that level of perfection, and I'll talk about a few of them later on, everybody is silent. Everybody is silent. And there might be a thousand, or fifteen hundred, or, or, or two thousand, or maybe five thousand people in the audience. Silence. So that's the first thing that. Excellence at that level in the aesthetic, the perfection creates this shock, which makes us therefore feel silent, speechless, and very small. You become small in the face of something so grand and so good. Secondly, what it does is that it creates awe. 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 Which results in, the, in a feeling of what I will call reverence. Yeah? Reverence. Ihtiram darada. As well as inspiration by teasing our own passions. Yeah. Moreover, cultural work thus presented equips us to enter into the experience of others. And it makes it possible to cultivate and compare sensibilities, tastes that could in turn trigger solidarity across human experiences. Yeah. definitions. Let me leave the definitions there for the time being. I'm going to mix Somali a little bit with, with the English. Yeah? Uh, So I, we, we, can't, we can't legislate from the floor now. That's too late. Let me move on then to topic, uh, subtopics. It took me two, two months to work on this, my friend. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somalis will have to learn other languages too. Yeah. You are, you are in Britain, you have to speak English. Yeah. With all due respect. With all due respect. Yeah. Uh, Subtopics. So let me speak then about the four topics that I have suggested that I will speak on them rather very briefly. And the first one is intellectual production. And intellectuals as cultural producers. The great Edward Said, in his 1996 magnificent essay, 
the limits of artistic imagination and the secular intellectual identified six primary roles for intellectuals. These three stand out for me, although he talked about six, but I'll give you three that stand out for me. Intellectual production uh, and intellectuals engage in what Said calls archival work. You know what it, we have in the libraries. Library is a building for archives, things to be kept there so that others will refer to them. Archival because they create counter information that defies, if not tells, the lie about hegemonic consensus. And thus, to quote Said, privilege human agency and responsible choice. So that's number one. Number two of the intellectual, Said Said, is that intellectual production is interpretive and epistemological. Interpretive and epistemological. What that means, therefore, is that intellectual production requires that one masters you master spatialized idiom. Pejoratively, we call this jargon. Yeah? But spatialized idiom, specialized language, tied to particular classes, not just you, but other classes, corporate guilds, for example, and then translated those idiom into language that can be understood by the common people, at least educated common people, and therefore open to others to engage in this. Said says that this includes demystification of the context by articulating enduring issues of war and peace, justice, human rights, and genuine development. The third thing that Said talks about in terms of the work of intellectuals as cultural producers is that intellectuals are also what he calls moralists, moral moralists. And that means that they express distant claims distant claims, and argue for principles where the prevailing climate usually counsels experience. That's not enough for intellectuals. They have to articulate the things that need to be done that are in the future, not just what is possible today, but what ought to be possible in the future. So moral questions and vision questions. Now, I'd like to add then to Said's work one more concept, and that is the work of synthesis, the importance of synthesis. In a brilliant conception, Emmanuel Wallerstein, the great sociologist, proposes that the intellectual operates at three levels. Level one, the intellectual is an analyst, someone who is in search of truth. You analyze something so that you can find what the truth is. That's the first task. The second task of the intellectual, he says, Emmanuel Wallerstein, is that the intellectual is a moral person in search of the good and the beautiful. The good and the beautiful. Not just the truth, but also the good and the beautiful. And then the third per thing that an intellectual does in his work or her work, he says, is that it's, a, it, it, it's about politics. And that is, as a political person, the intellectual seeks to unify the true and the good and the beautiful. To be able to unify the true runta, accent, to unify those then requires ideas. Yeah? Ideas and knowledge then that make us challenge the existing reality at any given time and try to move beyond that reality at that particular time. Now, about two decades ago, in an exquisite essay, the South African painter, another artist, who also a poet, Brayton Breitenbach, wrote that, and I quote, artistic creations do not reflect life. Artistic creations do not reflect life. In fact, he says, they are life-like and constitute life of their own. There is much, I think, to that perspective. But to be sure, artistic work is more than a reflex of our own immediate mood. And yet, there is something undeniable about the intimacy of art and the complexity of human life. 
the greatness and indispensability of art, declares Friedrich Nietzsche, lies precisely in its being able to produce the appearance of a simpler world, a shorter solution of the riddle of life. No one who suffers from life can do without this appearance, just as no one can do without sleep. Art, says Nietzsche, art exists so that the bow shall not break. That's life. So to keep it like that, so it doesn't break, he says, Nietzsche, we need art like we need sleep. Let me leave the intellectuals there for the time being and talk about music. I think a major element of the artistic creativity, music that is, music underscores the dialectical role of art as at once a release of human imagination, at its best virtuosity, playing at that peak level, and the response to the pressures of everyday life. Everyday life. Music suggests the unforgettable Canadian pianist, Glyn Gould. Glyn Gould says, Music is honed from negation. It is but very small security against the void of negation that surrounds us. End of quote. Now, akin to other forms of art, then, one might propose that music, among the oldest of components of human cultures, makes an appearance in the contemporary epoch in at least four guises. One, music, the continuation of age-old aesthetic appeal and love of harmony that strokes private and personal sensibilities. Imagine, my friends, for a moment, the explosive sensation and a sweetening of life that accompanies this Canadian genius, Glyn Gould. If you ever heard him play, yeah, uh, listen to Glyn Gould and see what he does to your sensibilities. As he exhibits rhythmic inclusiveness on the piano. Or in the Somali context, behold the masters, such as Hussein Bajuni, Ahmed Ismail Hudaydi, Ahmed Naji, Omar Dule or Daoud Ali Mashaf playing the classical tunes such as Berd al Ashe on the Oud. Just listen to that at that level. At the Inun the Doh Gujred, what's right there. Yeah? At the Kaled, the Wain Dibla was Otta Barabin Horus. Now, an, adhi an, an adhesive, something that binds a particular community through collective music also is an adhesive that binds a particular community through collective taste and emotions. Collective taste and emotions. When he plays, Ahmed plays, Daoud plays, Bajuni plays, he's dead now. When they play, everybody, you feel this. And all, already then there is a message in this that you belong together as people. And that musical instrument and the virtuosity of his hands brings us together that there is something here that others might not be able to relate to. Third, music is a mechanism to spread one tradition to another. One tradition to another. Somali to, for example, Ethiopian. Or Somali or English. Or Somali or Arabic. Or Somali and Sawahili. Have you ever heard Asha Abdul sing in, in, in Somali? And then turns around and sings in Sawahili and then turns around and, and sings in Arabic. Yeah? Music can create that kind of a co communication between different cultures and peoples. And then fourth, music is also business. It carries the law of value through commodification in a historical social system whose logic and its survival yeah, are based on constant expansion. So mu music becomes a commodity that is sold across seas and across lands and across civilizations. Though the personal and the communal may not be bereft of materialist value, they nonetheless touch upon passions that trigger and then hold together intense individual and collective sensations. 
in a moment of originality that privileges the exceptional power of music. Rousseau, the great French philosopher, writes, and I quote, one of the great advantages the musician enjoys is that she or he can paint things that cannot be heard. Whereas the painter cannot represent things that cannot be seen. The musician's art consists in substituting for the imperceptible image of the object, that of the emotions which that object's presence excites in the beholder's heart. Rousseau continues, it will not only chain up the sea, fan the flames of conflagration, but will also depict the desolation of dreadful deserts, dusk the walls of subterranean dungeons, abase the storm, clear and still the air, and from the orchestra spread renewed freshness from the woodlands. Music, it will exist, he says, in the soul, the very same sentiments which one experiences upon seeing them. So that much for music for now. We'll come back to them a little later. Talk a little bit about poetry. Well, go goes, yeah? Poetry. Why does poetry matter? Why does it matter? And for some artists, this should be a special question here, because that's the only great credit that the world has given us, is that we are people of poetry, nation of bards, they used to call us over 200, 300 years ago. The epic an early 18th century English romantic poet, Shelley, in his, quote, in his uh, uh, defense of essay, a defense of poetry, tells us, and I quote Shelley, poetry enlarges the circumstances of the imagination by replenishing it with thoughts of ever new delight, which have the power of attracting and assimilating to the, na to the nature all other thoughts and which form new intervals and interstices whose void forever craves fresh food. Shelley says, poetry strengthens the faculty, which is the organ of moral nature of man in the same manner as exercise. Exercise strengths a limb, the body. That's how important poetry is for Shelley. It can make us aware of realities that demand, secondly, uh, poetry is important because it can make us aware of realities that demand involvement in politics, whether it's here in Britain or in the Somali society. Listen to the legendary Abdullahi Sultan Tima'ad nearly 50 years ago. Africa then is where the Dafa'adi at the Babka Nolay say, Diba Loga Jog said they, Markay Debinta Rugene. Lagaduruk Dorad, Galab Kui, Daskusarnae, Tarek Pai Hornimado, Heshei, Logumati Kaine, Ninka An Uddog Daban Bieha, Lomaso Dare, Dierna Laska Wakota, Doh Hado Tage, and you, you, get the, you get the point. And then he continues, a long poem, so I won't go through all of it, but he continues. Dogonima Somaliwa Logu Dogale. Hadum bay do da de Santahai, Hadum bay do ye Santahai, Shay yedi delay, Imicala don donaya, dir ye da rode, Dan so malia la mahaye, wa da bal kale, Shabigi da gala da ugala, da tansu yade, the store ya a gon a yan, ediba donaine, Nina and do led by hammer for the da, how the bal digging, Ega daya, cabaygu, wa ega see darayai, Adima Otimat. It takes you directly to politics. <laughs> Poetry is also important because it can activate our place in the natural world, in the environment, the natural world, and among us other creatures, not just human beings. In other words, poetry creates a language that often is inspired by nature and natural objects, such as mountains, rivers, lakes, flowers, trees, or creatures like a horse. If you, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan in Finin, if you go to that guy, he's talking about horse. But the image that he creates are stunning. Or it can be a lion, an elephant, a gazelle. Remember that famous Somali song of about 40 years ago, in the Derele? 
in that dera, in that dera lay. You remember that? Those of you who are musically minded. Or this. Kela marku dera rania hai labanin dukta ye labanin dukta ye labanin dukta. So it takes you, once you see this uh, a, a, a group of, of, of uh, camels and chickens in a wonderful place, rains have taken place, plenty of grass and water, and a lot of milk. And the image that it creates is, is not just about this particular camel, it's the whole environment that it calls you to. So, it sh so poetry sharpens our appreciation for the beauty and abundance of the physical world, or synthesizes us to the struggle against environmental desiccation, environmental destruction. All of the above, therefore, calls us back to nature. Fourth, poetry propels us to free our imagination, enrich our modes of expression. That is the creation of new vocabulary through metaphor, the essential tool in the craft of poetry, metaphor. Metaphor is a figure of speech which presents an opportunity to see a thing in terms of another. You see one thing in relationship to another. See one thing in terms of another. That's the capacity to pick similarities and differences. Aristotle, the great philosopher of long time ago, suggested that a poet was someone with extraordinary ability to see likenesses, similarities. That's what the poet is. Poetry also is important, finally, because it can replenish our spirituality. By what? By doing what? By instructing us to talk about our own lives. Yeah. Sin Lei, yeah. uh, that long, yeah. uh, so many different poets contributing to this. But they were talking about our lives. So poetry helps us to talk about our lives. Poetry also inspires us how to not only talk about our lives, but how to conduct our lives. What's the best way to live? How do we conduct our lives? If you listen to Tim Ahate, he's always talking about this, about how to live a good life and how to conduct one's life. Or for that matter, other great poets. Yeah. Salan Arabi, Ismail Mira, Kamam yeah. Bulhan, so many others yeah, talk about this. Poetry is also important because it helps us become conscious about possibilities. The possibilities, what we, what we cannot see that the poet can see, and what can be possible, therefore. And encourages us, therefore, to look for possibilities and not be satisfied with the present. Poetry, finally, also helps us to come to terms with the ultimate. And the ultimate, of course, is death. It helps us come to terms with death. And it, therefore, as we begin to look at death in the face, each one of us begins to think about the legacy, what you leave behind for others. And poetry is very important, inspiring people, therefore, not only to have the courage to die, because you have to die, but the courage. But at the same time, to think about after that, in terms of legacy, or what you leave for others behind. And the final then topic I want to discuss is religion. Very important. And we'll take a whole seminar to do that. According to Durkheim, the great uh, sociologist and anthropologist of religion, religion is the organized effort to close the abyss, the abyss, good dare, to close the abyss between what we know or could know and the mysterious or the unknown. How to bring those two together, what we know and we can discover and we know, and what we cannot know or we, we don't know. It is the, therefore helps us, religion helps us to close that gap as much as humanly possible between what we know or we could know and the mysterious and the unknown. The first, therefore, what we could know is identified as the, the profane universe called, Durkheim calls it the profane everyday life, profane universe, or the quotidian, the ordinary experience. The latter, the mysterious, the unknown underscores the sacred the exceptional world beyond human experience. Second element about religion is that it, science itself is like in many ways similar to religion because science is also a way in which human beings have invented. 
so that they make an attempt, scientists make an attempt to see if they can connect the known, what we know now, to what we do not know yet, to make that discovery, that connection. So religion and science really, therefore, are very important sources of knowledge, both of them. The third thing about religion, any religion, not just ours, but any religion, connects us to external power, external power. It settles our engagement with the world that ultimately offers an anchor within the volatility of everyday experience and collective endeavors. Everyday experience is very unstable life. Everyday experience. It might, therefore, in the end, uh, the religion that is, in the end, help us to deal with human pain and the humiliation of poverty, for example. How does one live with pain in, in life? Deep poverty and pain. Religion becomes a, a one way of trying to understand that and come to terms with that, even when you cannot solve all the problems. This is stabilization in the face of chaotic life. Religion as a source of stabilization is primarily realized through rituals. Yeah? Things that are repeated again and again and again through the generations and the millennia. Rituals. Best demonstrated, the best way to demonstrate that, of course, of rituals is to worship God. That's the, that's the most important ritual. Yeah? Standing in front of God and worshiping God, Allah. Yeah. Most important uh, 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 ritual. Ramadan, therefore, in many ways. At one level, Ramadan is a very healthy exercise. You empty the belly and dry it up and maybe lose a little bit of weight. Those of you who are overweight, I'm not, but those of you who might be, yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's healthy in that sense. But underneath that health, though, it's a ritual also. It's getting closer to God. Yeah? Getting closer to God. Yeah. Uh, so the ritual of Ramadan in many ways is one step to get closer to God for that month. Deeper than the other perhaps uh, 11 months. Religion therefore and finally and this is very important for Somalis wherever they are I think we live in very turbulent and bewildering times. Everybody says the worst society in the world. The most failed society in the world. Even if there are exceptions in certain parts of Somali society. But the general story now is like this. We live in turbulent and bewildering times. And when human beings live in bewildering and difficult times. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Excellent. In bewildering times, very difficult times, religion then has often remained powerful enough to precipitate movements with enormous social energy. That bottom by Dr. Ajstad, into Burkas. Anyway, we want to do something about this in times of bewildering turbulence and chaos. Precipitates movements with intense and immense social energy. These could either be, but they become in two kinds. Either that energy becomes one that's very progressive, creative, and, in, and in, with alliance with secularity and therefore becomes life transforming. Or that energy driven by religion becomes the opposite of this. It becomes reactionary, inflicting upon the believers repressive and costly backwardness. Deep, no gist. And you can never really go back. Never. I dare you to see if you can go back to yesterday. You can't. But anyone, therefore, who tells you that you can go back is, is selling you a bill of goods that really are false. So religion, therefore, in these difficult times, two types. Progressive, creative, transforming human life so that men and women then move on to a new stage of civilization and culture. Or religion becomes or is used that energy in which repression, backwardness, become the mode of existence. Let me then conclude uh, the, and go to my final remarks. And I want to get back then to the two concepts that I started with. Development first. To repeat then, development is a perpetual human challenge. 
akin to the myth of Sisyphus. You remember Sisyphus, that mythology. Sisyphus taking the boulder up the hill, trying to take it all the way to the top, but can't because it, it comes back. So, but Sisyphus doesn't give up. It becomes, therefore, his life, he, this mythology that you have to always try taking it up. In the hope someday maybe you can take it to the top and then downhill. But it's always uphill. Development, therefore, is a project of perpetual human challenge akin to the myth of the labor of Sisyphus. Unless it condemns itself forever to a condition of contemptible sect, squalor, squalor and self-humiliation, no society, listen to this, unless it condemns itself forever to a condition of contemptible squalor and self-humiliation, no society can escape this eternal challenge. In other words, there is no immunity against the logic of the second law of thermodynamics. Those of you in science, you will know that second law of thermodynamics, which primarily basically means the constant struggle with relentless entropy, that is to say the dissipation of energy and decay, second law of thermodynamics. Every society confronts this. Every human being confronts this. The major difference therefore lie, if you look at the rest of the, the whole world, the major difference lie in the level of shared civic consciousness inscribed in their history, practical institutions and readiness and dedication. That's where the difference lies between the Somalis and the Brits, between the Somalis and the Chinese. Nothing so secretive and mysterious about this. Yeah. At least I will argue. The major difference lies, since everybody, no one can escape this challenge, lie in the, at the level of shared civic consciousness inscribe it in the history of that particular society and practical and institutional readiness and dedication to undertake that labor of Sisyphus all the time and in every generation. Culture, therefore, the making of human sensibilities is critical to the establishment of collective identity, mutual understanding, robust associative belonging. But when a culture is either made into a calcified artifact deprived of investment for renewal, or intentionally degraded, if not destroyed, what's happened to Somali society, that society is likely to enter a zone of emptiness, aesthetic impoverishment, and eventually despair. This condition turns society against itself and against its future. Art, or fen, as the Somalis will call it, in Terry Eagleton's summation quote, is a critique of alienation, an exemplary realization of creative powers. The ideal reconciliation of subject and object, universal and particular, freedom and necessity, theory and practice, individual and society. In other words, fun at its best is a source of excellence, joy, energy, and renewal to break the ever-present gray and chill of monotony and predictable ordinariness. The proper approach, I'm concluding now, for Somalis, since this is a primarily Somali crowd, the proper approach for Somalis in this early part of the 21st century, in this epoch, in my opinion, then, is a combination, the combined combination of a discerning preservation, preservation that is selective in terms of cultural artifacts, discerning preservation, and intelligent innovation. The combination of those two. On one side, you want to preserve certain things, but sifad, like in the wahad, don't say in the haysa today. Wahad hashish wal bahaysa, sifad. Yeah, clean it up and preserve what's, what, is, what is beautiful and good and lasting. And then connect that to intelligent innovation. Yeah, tabdil, kus hiran de, maskaha da iyo, fikrat intelligent innovation. I will end then with this quotation from Hannah Arendt that speaks to this point. In her seminal volume, The Human Condition, Arendt writes, and I quote, if the world, if the world is to contain a public space, she says, it cannot be erected for one generation and planned for the living only. 
it must transcend the lifespan of mortal men and women. It is what we have in common, not only with those who live with us right now, but also those who were here before and those who will come after us. Thank you very much. <laughs>